Hello, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jana Smith and I'm out of our Fargo office and I devote all my time to topics just like this. So it's either forecasting in a general consulting sense or um, associated with an examined or compiled forecast, usually most associated with the debt issuance. And I'll pass it over. Hi, this is Sean Delury. I have I bring 15 years of experience in CPA firms. Oh, I'm third, but and I, I work with Jana in the Examine Forecast Group. I also do some strategic financial planning and modeling. And um, during the winter, I do some ECA reporting work for healthcare and non-healthcare clients. So good afternoon, and I look forward to going over uh, these models with you this afternoon. With that, I will pass it over to Jared. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm Jared Heim. I'm a partner with Ide Bailey. I've been with uh, the firm for over 16 years now. Worked with healthcare clients my entire career in a variety of different capacities. Um, and then the past seven years, I've been leading our firm's strategic financing group. Uh, within that, you know, working closely with Jana and Sean, uh, majority of our work is on the financial forecasting side of things. Um, and doing other financial modeling for debt capacity studies, uh, service line analysis, pro formas, market studies, those types of things. And, and really that, that modeling kind of feeds us into our presentation today and topic as we look at COVID-19 and uh, financial modeling, forecasting, and reforecasting during this certainly unprecedented time. Uh, so we'll we'll start with a just a quick overview of the agenda for today. Um, I want to spend some time just talking about financial modeling, um, why it's important, and how we use it uh, to help our healthcare clients. Um, we'll have Sean cover a little bit of the the factors impacting bed demand on a on a national scale, as it looks at some of the modeling that's being done on on the national level for some of the hospital resource and bed need. And then um, Jana and Sean will both spend some time actually in a couple of the financial modeling solutions that we've that we put together. Um, we think we've got some great tools uh, for everybody to kind of walk through today. So hopefully that that live demonstration will will give you a sense and feel for the flexibility and functionality for each one of the models. And then, as Amy alluded to earlier, uh, we hope to have some time at the end for some questions. To make sure that we're you know covering everything that you need and and again we just want to thank everybody for for joining us here today i know it's a friday afternoon and probably the 100th webinar you've had the opportunity to sit through this week so um bear with us for the next 55 minutes or so and uh, we'll try and keep this as entertaining as possible and and keep you moving with the rest of your work week so when we think about financial modeling you know it's it really comes down to us helping out a client work through a, a, a significant decision and looking through some various strategic factors. Um, one of the things that's, that's extremely important for us is to kind of model through and be able to display a variety of different scenarios and really provide solutions and answers in a real time setting. So um, as you heard all of us talk about the things that we work on, um, we spend our lives in models virtually every single day. Most of the time it's, it's dealing with a new construction or a remodel or a new practice acquisition, a new provider, new contract, um, a lot of those different scenarios. So um, and when we think about those types of strategic decisions, you know, those are a lot of times within the control of management and they're looking at, at the factors that they can control and making a yes or no type of a decision uh, based on those financial results that come through those financial modeling in that real time format and you know making that ultimate decision based on on a you know return of return on investment or or cash flow or various profitability however the last uh, last month or two has really created a lot of turmoil within the healthcare industry as well as many different industries we've we've seen some significant uh, fluctuations in terms of the utilization of services within the healthcare industry, um, some limitations on some of the surgeries or some of the procedures that we can perform. Uh, so that's had a significant impact then on revenues and volumes and expenses. Through the CARES Act, uh, I would say, you know, most all of our healthcare organizations that we work with have received some sort of financial stimulus funds. 
Um, so that's then left them with the question of what should we be doing with these funds? How long are these funds going to help us in this time of dip in volume to, to help kind of make up for this lost revenue? And then ultimately, as we look forward, what are the next six months going to look like? What is the next 12 months? Um, you know, the healthcare environment, I think, is ever evolving. We're learning, um, you know, new ways to communicate with patients. And I think really the, um, you know, the outside world is starting to get a little bit more comfortable with telehealth and, and those reimbursement streams are going to be changing. So then again, it's about, um, you know, gearing our, our clients with the information, the data um, to be able to to focus on the things that they can control, staffing, those types of things, as you are faced with a variety of different external factors that are a little bit out of your control. Today, you know, we've got, as I mentioned, two models that, that we'd like to, to walk through. Um, you know, one is a little bit more service line driven and, and looks at some financial dynamics and impact on, on the bottom line and cash flow. And then the other one is much more of an income statement approach um, that takes a little bit of, of incorporation of budgeting, actual results, and ways to reforecast out your budget to, to help project out where those year-end numbers are going to be, ultimately keeping in mind um, some of those year-end financial uh, covenants that you're looking to meet, compliance requirements, or any other indicators that you or your board or other external third parties are are looking at focusing and targeting and meeting um, from a financial perspective. So I'd like to, you know, at this point, turn it over to Sean uh, to go over some of, uh, again, some of that national level of modeling and benchmarking as we look at hospital resource need and utilization, which kind of ultimately kind of funnels into and feeds some of the assumptions for uh, looking at future volumes and future demands. So Sean, uh, if you would take us away here. All right, thanks, Jared. Um, like, you know, the useful models has has really taken off with COVID-19, as Jared said. Um, I just wanted to talk and touch a little bit on bed demand since that's a major area that we looked at, at least initially. I'm not going to, you know, make us go to Wuhan, China, just because of <clears throat> timing and, you know, it's a Friday afternoon. But I'm going to start there just for a minute because that's where a lot of the bed demand probably was starting to be looked at as we looked at this environment that we were in. We had this virus come upon us you know, there, and then they, it was spreading very quickly. So the question emerged as they were looking at it was, well, how many beds do we have? How many beds do we need to service this population as this virus is continuing to um, expand or transmit through the population? They put social distancing in place to, to, to stem it, and they got it down to a reasonable number. Now it came over to the United States, same, same thing happened, you know, in February and into March. We're looking at bed demand going, what happens you know, if this spread continues to play out um, like it like it was looking at, I mean, California was showing it was the viruses were going to double every three and a half days. Um, the United States was looking like it was a little bit slower than that, but that is a really fast, you know, doubling rate if it continued. So we have stay at home orders and social distancing to curb, or I, I like to think about as coiling demand so that we don't overrun our supply that's available of, of, of available beds. So we have it under, you know, moderate control now as a, as a, um, as we're looking at bed demand and you look at the Washington model that looks at bed demand I think all of us have probably taken a look at that um, every other week or so they were saying you know they were looking at it to help hospitals and also look at the number of deaths that were in the United States to project that out they were looking at 72, 72,000 deaths in the end of their first iteration of the model and then they recently updated it, I think, on Tuesday to, to take into account these things of changing the stay-at-home order statuses, like obviously most notable in the press in Georgia and other states as we're looking to, again, uncoil um, where we're at and get people back mobile again. They saw that happening, and they also saw that uh, the population was just becoming more mobile. They looked at cell phone data on all of us and saw us staying at home. And then as we started to get into April and mid-April and then into May here, we're becoming just more mobile by nature. We're venturing out again. So that's having an impact on demand too. So their latest estimate showed in fact, factoring in those things that, that the death rate was gonna almost double or go up to 132. I think they're at 134 this morning. 
of uh, deaths due to, you know, due to the virus. So as things are changing, these models, it's helpful to have adjustable models that we're going to go through that are changing in real time as the conditions are. So I have here just showing four large impacts that, that are going to change bed demand. Obviously, stay-at-home order status, as we're lifting those, the bed demand is going to fundamentally change or increase um, demand as we remove those statuses. Populations just becoming more mobile, like the Washington model said, is going to increase bed demand. Um, businesses' willingness to open will increase bed demand. Now, obviously, a business is going to open if they have um, a population that's willing to go there. You think of the restaurant, they're not going to open unless the population is willing and is, feels safe to go to those restaurants. So we're, as those open, we're going to be more um, clustered. We're going to be together again as, as communities. That's going to change the bed demand. And so the fourth factor is just that what we would model in a bed demand in a bed demand look or model is the speed and how much the spread is going through the population. So we have an image down below showing as demand factors go up, the transmission and the spread is going to rise as well. And just to, just to pinpoint that, we do have a high level bed demand model that we started to put together. So the left side of it is showing, <clears throat> is showing how it's looking right now. So the I, you know, the Washington model is showing, yeah, we are at, we are stable. We don't have doubling right now as I'm, as I'm circling. We, our infection rate is relatively small and we're on, you know, the downside of our, of our curve, of our first wave curve. You think of the wave, it's a, it's a bell-shaped curve. We were up, we were increasing. We were at what New York City called the epicenter of the top. Now we've, now we've gone over the top and we're on the downside of the curve. Well, now Georgia and other states have released, have changed social distancing and some of those things. So that's going to, on the IHME or the Washington model has increased that bell a bit and made it a little fatter on the decrease side. So, so demand is changing as a result as we're changing the condition. So on the right, we have what's kind of a worst case. What if we uncoil it completely and say no social distancing? Um, there's no, there's no more, there's no more restriction on the double rate, which increases our our demand for beds. So this shows the United States yesterday had a double rate of about 50 days. So it doubles every 50. We have instead of 3% infected, we're going to get to 80%, which some consider herd immunity. We still have 50% being having symptoms and 50% non. You can see the green is the, is the available beds in the United States, net the filled beds. So we have about 950,000 beds, 65% of them are occupied. So we have 330,000 beds. And out of those available, you can see the, the blue bars is the daily demand increase. And as you can see, as we get into the late fall or on 11.6, as the box suggests there that on that graphic, our, our uh, demand has met supply. And then everything after that is how many times do we exceed that demand? And we're exceeding that demand by about five times at the end of the rainbow, at the end of it. So, and then at the end, we have a peak demand of about 1.9 million. So this gets back to, back to China or back to early United States modeling of this thing. Why we put these things in place, we didn't want to obviously outstrip or over exceed uh, the, the supply of beds available. That gets us to the other two models in, in a way, at least um, well, both models. I'm going to jump into the strategic financial impact model in a minute, but before I do, I want to explain it a little. And why it dives into that is how Jared suggested that we have, um, we have the social distancing in place to stop you know, the demand from exceeding our supply. Well, some of the, one of those things that we did was we reduced our availability of elective procedures. Some, some think surgery, but more as, we're, as we've seen it, and obviously you've experienced it um, directly, this has been a broad range of services that have been reduced. So we kind of coined that as elective procedures. So we've built this model, the strategic impact model, to be a flexible real-time feedback model, as you'll see as I open it, um, to assist in understanding those impacts on elective procedures. So how that changes our organization operations and our financial outlook. So we're looking at today really the elective procedures that I outlined. And, and the service signs we, we're going to look at is surgery, clinic, inpatient, other ancillaries or outpatient, and then the all other bucket that encapsulates everything else. Uh, we also have room to look at COVID-19 surges. If you're, if you're a COVID-19 center, we can look at the impact it's having on you as you have 
fluctuations in your surging for COVID-19. If you're not a COVID-19 center, then maybe the question is, do you have um, transfer surges in and out due to you being a non-COVID center? And if I'm a COVID center, then I need to transfer something, some of my patients over to you. There's some transferring going on in these hospitals. And then just other operational responses, either to the three above or just independent that's coming up as we're looking at this. So how the model is designed is, is how all models are kind of designed. We have a baseline set scenario. So we're setting a baseline to lay the COVID-19 adjustments on. In the case we're gonna go over today, it's a budget. And what we're really looking at is an income statement adjustment. So we're considering obviously gross revenues, net revenue, uh, what's defined as operating expenses. We have a placeholder for capital expenses defined as interest and depreciation, placeholders for other revenue, other income to arrive at our total margin, which is important to look at as we're looking at the operations, the financial statements being the scorecard of operating changes. We're also looking at how this impacts cash flow. As Jared alluded to earlier, cash flow is very important, especially right now. Um, is that given the change here and the stimulus through the CARES Act and other things, cash flow is just very important. We'll also look at it in terms of days cash on hand. How does our days cash change as our cash flow changes? How much days do we have to meet daily operating expenses? And then debt service coverage, which is a function of our cash flow available to compared to our debt load. If we don't have a service line, this is based on a service line look. So if we don't have a service line presentation, we, we, we do use the Medicare cost report to accommodate that. So obviously the Medicare cost report is a department view of, of our revenues and expenses. And we also are using it because frankly, a lot of our clients that we're doing this with are so far have been critical access hospitals or cause. So we do wanna be mindful of the critical access impact and measure that appropriately. So when we're using the cost report, what we're doing is we're determining what's direct revenue and we're determining what's ancillary revenue. And so the ancillary revenues are everything that's not direct and is comprised of your images, your labs, your therapies, uh, your, your drugs, and, and that's, that's most of the groupings of our ancillaries. We're cutting it across to create a service line. The expenses will follow that revenue allocation, well, especially the, the operating expenses. So then we get to the service line view, which is where we think that the elective procedures are ultimately impacted at, as you'll see, is at the service line level. So what we have here is, is the look of it. We have it locked down. So we have, we have three main looks of that, uh, or three main. So we have three main uh, tabs of the model. So we have this, which is our summary board look. And what it has is it has our, it has our variables on the upper left quadrant there. So we have allocations and then the dip, which I'm gonna go over. So we have our variables we can change there. And then we have um, hospital-wide ratios over here. So we have days cash on hand, we have debt service coverage and total margin that I touched on earlier. And then we have a mini cash flow over here since cash flow is, is critically important at this time in terms of 2019 historical year, the baseline, and then the COVID, the co impacts from COVID. So we have the service lines color-coded. We have surgery, the clinic, inpatient, or adults and peds, other ancillary, and all other in, in those colors. But that corresponds to the graphs to the right, which are showing the volumes changing over the 12 months of the year for those four service lines, surgery through other ancillary. Um, we, have, we have the scenario mocked up right now, so in terms of the dip. But before I get into that, here's how we're defining the service lines. So we have ancillaries coming across in terms of 35% of those that I outlined, again, imaging, therapies, labs, et cetera, that's coming across to, those, to, those answer, to, the, to the surgery, clinic, adults, and so on. So we have 35% of our ancillaries coming to surgery right now. If, you want, if, you want, if we wanted to change that, we can, and our, our, just, our things change in real time, or our impacts change in real time. So our day's cash on hand, adjusted for the ancillary change, our total margin debt service change for those changes. I'm gonna put it back to where I was. Another thing you might watch as I'm going down the line, I think you can see this, is I have a gray box, a gray area in the bottom right corner. This is showing our original scenario that we have mocked up right now in terms of net revenue for the entire hospital. And then, and then I have this hard code as this is what I'm starting with. And then you can see the difference as I'm going through to show the impact across the hospital. I'm gonna to touch on that on the bottom quick. So this shows the income statement at a contribution margin level 
for the service lines. So we have volumes in terms of the baseline and then the COVID um, adjustment and then the change. We have net revenue, salaries and employee benefits, and then all other expenses uh, down below. And then below that, we have a subsection of that in terms of what's variable and what's fixed. So, and then we get to total expenses, contribution margin to the system, and then a, a contribution margin percentage. So we have that for operating room, clinic in blue, uh, inpatient in gray, other ancillary in green, and then the all other in, in the light gray. And then another note, the all other includes the indirect expenses also. So, so those are housed there. If we wanted to change indirect, we could do that too. And then off to the bottom right is hospital wide or just the summation of those five going across. So then we get into the decline, we get into the dip or the change in elective procedures. So when we're looking at that, um, we have you know the decline. You can see the difference due to service line. And this is based on this first view is based on discussion with department managers who said, yeah, the surgery is going to be a hundred percent, the clinic's actually going to be a 50%, inpatient's going to be slight at 10. Um, other answer was 50, and the all other I was surprised was at 50 as well. So we and we can change that if we want and see how that impacts our results in real time. So we can, you know, let's say let's say the surgery is going to be 50. So I change it to 50. You can see our days cash, debt service, and indicators changed. My per, my in my uh, contribution margin look changed as well. And my hospital, you know, we increased our net revenue on a net basis of about a million and our net margin by just under a million. I can go back. Let's just go back to home and say that's our home scenario. Okay, so then we have, that's the depth of the decline. What about this? What about how long it is? You can change how long it is from two to three months. Okay, that's 285,000 on revenue, go back. Then we get it, once we get to what our decline is, how long is our decline? We can set how long our bottom is. Is it two months at bottom? Is it three months at bottom? So I changed it to a three month bottom. You can see all our graphs on the right change to reflect that. Now we have a three month surgery bottom as well as clinic. And you can see it impacted our net revenue by about $839,000. If it's, if it's a three month compared to a two month, let's go back to two. Um, so after we set the bottom, we get to a recoupment or coming out of that curve. So the question is, is what percent of our base are we gonna get to? And I have it set at 80% with the exception of adults and peds. You can, what if we get to 100% on the clinic? We're gonna get all the way back, okay? That gets us five, roughly 500,000 more net revenue than we had in our previous scenario. Okay, let's go back. Why 80%? Well, things might change. There's a lot of patients that might be a little timid to come back. There, there could be a, you know, a, a degree of factors that will means it'll take some time to get back to full. So then we're going to shave off some of that and discount it. Also have recoupment timing. How long does it take to get our recoupment back? Is it two months or is it one? Is it two months or three months. I'm gonna just keep put it back to two. Um, so you can set that. We have another, we have an additional add-on. What if there's a surge? We have pent up demand. What if some of that demand comes in? You can click, that has a click on feature to say included or not. Let's include it. So now we included a 60% surge to get back. Because if you look at the bottom section here that I highlighted now, our volumes are still down throughout the year because even if you get back to your baseline back, you still have lost volume during that decline. So if you can surge it, you can get some of that back. Now the question becomes, if I ramp up to 100, but okay, I'm at 100 cases, let's say 80 is my limit and I can only do 80 actually cases in my physical um, operating room, okay? You can either adjust the timing to see how long it takes to get to 80, if we, if we need to get to 80, or if we can't get to 80, then we go back down on our return timeline. Let's go back down a couple months and go, what if maybe we just gotta reduce our surge then we can't get to 100% surge, we gotta get to something. And this is kind of where you plug and play with it and see where you get to. What does it take to get to 80? Maybe our surge realistically is 40%. I'm gonna turn it back off. So now we're back to even. Um, so we see what the impact of this review, this look of the de of the decline of elective procedures is. It's about you know 6.7 million dollars of net revenue, a reduction of 25 percent, or 6.5 million of contribution margin. What if we have an expense uh, response to that, or we do some other things to get back? The I turned the expense reduction on, and the first 
dial is in this review is, what does it take to get to a debt covenant of 1.25? And this, it looks like it's about $4.7 million of, of net expense to get back. Then you can toggle that and say, what if we do more or less? What does it take to get back? Or what do we real, realistically think we can cut um, and, and take out of the system? That can get back to, get back to even. Um, and then we have cash flows along the way. Um, so you can see the cash flow impact. So our change in this, in this review was, you know, 6.4 or $6.5 million of expenses coming out. We do, we do incorporate, you know, the stimulus in here. There was about a $2.5 million PPP financing in this um, payment protection plan loan in this. And then there was another, I think 500,000 that came in the door to get to 3.1. So, you know, a lot of people we were thinking early before we did this was, oh, well, we have the PPP loan and other money that's going to fund our, our margin loss. It doesn't look like that's the case if this is the size of our elective procedure decline and coming back timing. Looks like it's half. Um, so, that, so we can have some expense reduction impacts on there and see how that overlays in. So we put that in, 4.7 million of expense reduction. My other change is actually 3.9 because there's, there was 500,000 in there already, and this is a critical excess hospital, so as we're taking out 4.7 of expense, we're also taking out that share of the revenue as well. So this is, this is um, the main summary board presentation. It's a locked model. Um, we're sharing this with, we've done this with a few clients so far. Um, we're sharing them this, this model to share with boards, or we can go over it with boards as well, or department managers and the organization wide if, if um, I like to go that way. There are other uh, presentations that we have in this as well. So we have a service line presentation whoops, that shows the adjustment between um, the baseline for the 12 months that we're looking at and in terms of what the, what the budget was in this case or the base and then what the COVID change is and then the adjusted. So this is the volume change for that service line or the volume that we had. Here's the volume coming out the timing, and then here's our adjusted numbers. And then we do the same drill for gross revenue, net revenue, salaries, we don't have any, because again, PPP, we weren't, we weren't touching salaries yet. You can if we, if we elect to go that way to model. Benefits, other operating, you can see that coming out. And then there's the net effect, the contribution margin that we, that we had, and then, the, and then the COVID impacts on contribution margin and the net effect. We also have those for the other service lines. You can see down below, we have it for the five service lines for surgery. We have it for the clinic and just, just the other ones are down below too. In the, in the middle, we have a more traditional a financial statement look that looks, at, that looks at terms of the income statement. Sorry, I'm trying to adjust it to the screen. That has a look in terms of how it overlays on the income statement. So we have this different uh, service lines as columns so for surgery, clinic, inpatient. And then we have the gross revenues in terms of what's the direct and what's the ancillary. So you can start to see what is that ancillary overlay coming across the service lines look like. And again, if we don't agree with that, we can change it on the, on the, oper on the main board there, or we can go into the model itself, which is, which is locked and change it there. We have net revenues, other revenue as a placeholder, direct expenses, direct contribution margin, and then you can see the indirect expenses coming in there, and capital expenses, depreciation interest to get to net income, and then ultimately you know, net margin. So we have a more traditional um, income statement there as well. So I think you know, this model can be helpful in layering in multiple scenarios. It's an impact model um, as meant to be a discussion model or communication model between management and possibly governing boards. Um, layering on scenarios and just really looking at what's our base and comparing it to if we change operationally, how does that change impact our financial scorecard and, and understanding how those changes are affecting the operation and the financial picture. So I know I went fairly quickly. If there's questions, we'll try to get to them at the end. Otherwise, if you do have questions on it, you can email me or, or Jared and Jana and you can um, yeah, email or call or send if you have a question, you can send your information on that question area. And uh, with that, Amy, we can, you can send it over to Janet to talk about the rolling uh, forecast model.
All right. So some of these we included in your board or in your packets so that you can review them later. Um, but this is the flavor for what Sean just presented now. So the rolling forecast model. Um, this is the piece that that um, I've worked on most closely. And when I think about some of the issues that we're running into with our clients, you know, the planning documents that you use generally aren't working right now for a multitude of reasons. And first is that your budget is outdated. And that often happens in any year at some point, but it's never been more true now. And the other piece is that your projected year end outcomes are just difficult to define. So in any industry, I think that can be hard, but in healthcare specifically, there are additional layers to that, um, whether it's your payer mix, your reimbursement mechanisms, and now the added element of stimulus funds and how that interplays with everything else. Um, it just really makes your projected year end difficult to define. And then lastly, data. So healthcare has plentiful data, but it's often cumbersome or really difficult to pull and you're constantly being pulled back and forth on this cost benefit analysis, which is, is the time and energy required by me to pull that information together helpful? And is it going to have some utility in the end for me to make good decisions or any decision based on? And so with those things in mind, we tried to develop something that address those issues. And I'm gonna just read what we call a rolling forecast model definition because I think it just most quickly and accurately describes it. So a rolling forecast model allows management to make updates to the budget, incorporate known changes to operations, and create the ability to see fluctuations in volumes or expenses resulting in a projected income statement. I think the key word there is projected income statement. And so often what we're hearing is, okay, based on what I'm doing today, what's going to happen? What does my year end look like? And for better or for worse, that is a point in time that we're all accustomed to really honing in on. And reason for reasons for that are just compliance. So if you think about a lot of our organizations, there's some sort of debt covenant that they're trying to maintain, or um, there's just some internal goals that you're trying to maintain. So those might not be the same ones you had at the beginning of the year in terms of certain operational indicators, but you certainly as an organization probably have some now, whether it's maintaining your current staff or whether it's safety measures, whatever those might be, you're trying to manage all of those pieces together. So much like Sean referenced, there are drivers that really make up a lot of our models. And the three most, the three used in ours are what we're calling your actual results your budgeted results, and then your adjusted budget results. So the key for us was, how do we make something that you can use quickly that has value, but isn't getting so bogged down in some of the details of your financial statements or your trial balances? So the goal in this is really to take it to that financial statement level. And we would use your internal financial statements, likely something that you're already presenting on a monthly basis to your board, as your baseline, and then add on a few other pieces of information from there. So payer mix and FTE information are the two, not to the extent of you know delineating between administration and IT, just simply potentially three areas. So your variable FTEs, your um, fixed FTEs, and then like a clinic in this situation, or whatever re most represents your organization's baseline. And then your budget. So your budget is something that you probably already have prepared. And that would be something that we took on the onset and setup of your model. And so hopefully that wouldn't be difficult to provide either in terms of time on your end. And you might also say, okay, maybe I should have a budget prepared in this way, but we don't. So does that mean that this isn't going to be a product that's relevant for me? I don't think that's the case in a situation where you don't have a, a, a monthly budget that you're following right now. We would go back to your last fiscal year. So what was normal last May and use that as our starting point. And then the last piece here is what we're calling your adjusted budget. And so this is the place where you get to play or do those what if scenarios and say, okay, this is what we thought was going to happen. 
or this is what happened last year, how far off are we from those results? And what does that mean in terms of a year-end picture? So you'll see a few tabs on the bottom here and on, I'll spend a little bit more time on some rather than others. Uh, but the first is the budget. So this is this client's budget. And as you can see, it's not super detailed. You can look at the areas and lines that we're focused in on, on the left-hand side and each month across the top. And then all you'll notice that there's definitely some repetition between the tabs, that's intentional. It's just making sure we're comparing apples to apples. Much like Sean described, cash flows are very important. This isn't a super detailed cash flow, but it does take into account a lot of those heavy hitter items and also the ones that you know we most commonly see across organizations. So you have your beginning cash balance, your general activity, getting depreciation, amortization, unrealized gain loss, things like that out. Um, oftentimes you also have a capital expenditures budget. This would be the place where you can um, put in those property purchases for the year. And then of course your debt payments. In keeping with, again, some of the similarities between Sean and my model, or our model is the day's cash on hand, debt service coverage ratio. These are things you can monitor on a monthly basis. Also, would be in this situation available at, at year end as well. So this was the plan. And from your perspective as somebody who would utilize this, this is really pretty informational. We wouldn't expect a lot of change here. Um, it's just something to reference back to while you're in this model. Then you have your actual results. Again, you'll see a lot of repetition, but I think the thing to take away from here is the amount of energy and time you would need to pull this information together. So Hopefully, you know, I think we're looking every month at between 20 and 30 lines to key in. Hopefully this is something that you feel is manageable within your day now. And then the one addition that I would point out here is the stimulus funds. So this is the place where you can keep track of those dollars that have come in from all the various um, sources. And then again, of course, you have your plan for cash flows and then there's what actually happens. So maybe some of those capital purchases you pushed off and are down the road now, um, or maybe you ended up needing to purchase more things ahead of time for some um, other reasons. And then you get your, again, real-time days cash on hand and debt service coverage ratios. Again, you'll see some repetition here. So then we move into the adjusted budget. So this is the place where you get to play. Now you'll notice January through March, there aren't any changes. Those months have come and gone. If I figure out how to rewrite the past, I'll let you all know, but I don't hold your breath. And then you'll start to see things change here in April, May, June, July, and I believe through September. These were the months that we felt or this client felt they weren't going to be able to meet budget. And you'll also notice that this is at the dollar level. So your starting point is your budget. And how off from budget are we? And are we expecting to be or think we might be? Um, this is again at the dollar level. We're not chasing down stats, you know, volumes per, you know, or revenue per CT scan, things like that. So I think that helps um, pull out of some of the detail too. You also have the ability to look at your payer mix. So that is something that, you know, maybe you haven't in the past seen a lot of change in. But with all of these service lines changing and all of the access and who is it really going to the hospital now or whatever the case might be for your organization, this is the place where you could adjust for those things. Another thing I should mention too is this is certainly set up for a critical access hospital, but is definitely not limited to a critical access hospital if you're a PPS, a nursing home, assisted living. These are all things that are very interchangeable and can be tailored to your organization pretty quickly. And then again, for this piece, there is the ability to look at your contractual adjustments on a monthly basis. The reality is, is for this situation, it's a critical access hospital. So Medicare is not something that you really have the ability to adjust, but the other areas are certainly something that you could make real-time adjustments for. And then of course, the last two, charity care, bad debt. Um, I'll kind of slow down here. Other operating revenue, you'll see the stimulus funds coming in in April, $500,000. This 
this would be again the place where you can um, track those dollars as they're coming in and really make sure you know in total what you've received and then also be able to make those adjustments quickly. On the staffing side, with some assistance from stimulus, there haven't been any adjustments to staffing, but as those dollars change, there might be some adjustments here that you want to make and whatever that new normal really ends up looking like. And then lastly, we have kind of the other bucket, a place that I think you might think of using most is probably the supplies line, maybe for your professional fees line, depending on how your organization is run. But you know, whether you're using the same supplies and they cost more now, or you need more supplies for preparatory measures, this is where you would insert that information. And then where does this go to? So that blended result is really the place where you can see all of these things come together in a way that I think is meaningful. So the key here is that if you mouse over these boxes in the blue text line, you have the ability to toggle between your actual results, your budgeted results, and your adjusted budgeted results. So in this situation for months that have already come and gone, I'm not sure that you want to look back on what budget was because it's not necessarily relevant anyway. But in April here, let's just assume that we're not in May and April's not closed out and all those things, but you have your actual results, which don't exist yet. So that would not be populated. Your budgeted results, oh, your budgeted results. So what you thought was going to happen, you know, four or five months ago, and then where you think you're going to land now. And one item I would key in on here too is if you're trying to just get a, a general idea of what your lost revenue might be, toggling between your adjusted budget and your budget might give you a good indicator of that. The other piece that you'll notice here is your budget. So if I scroll down and say, what were we really expecting to have happen? We were saying we were gonna make six grand in our budgeted scenario. In this situation, where we've adjusted things, we're actually much better off and it's really all related to those stimulus dollars. So I think that's one thing that um, is really helpful as you're trying to just get in the ballpark of, of what's happening in your organization. As you mouse over or scroll over, you can get to a projected column, which is exactly that, your blended results of what's happened, what do we think might happen, and if we ever get back to budget, what does our year end look like? And then you can see here the results in this type of format. We took it one step further and said, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but keeping in mind what our key financial indicators are, how does that, what does that mean um, in terms of like a dashboard setting or a look that you would want to share with someone? So for this organization, we have operating margin, days cash on hand and debt service coverage ratios as our three areas to look at. And then we've delineated between with stimulus and without stimulus. And so I think it's helpful to just know what that means. And particularly now, as you look at after you've received all these funds, documenting and making sure that you retain those funds and what would happen if some of those dollars um, weren't forgiven. And, and really being mindful of what is today might not continue, and if it doesn't, what's the risk? So in this situation, I'll just kind of scroll down here. Of course, we have our cash flows, we have our day's cash on hand, and then our debt service coverage ratios. So the only other thing, and in this case, they, were, they have covenants, so we have those um, flowing across the graphs as well. So one other thing I would want to mention too is this excess and shortfall number, both on either covenant. And so I think the piece that I find to be helpful here is, okay, so we're meeting covenants in all circumstances, but what does that really equate to? How close to the line are we? And so when I think of that, I look at, okay, we're at a 1.31 without stimulus how close to the line are we? So in this case, it's about $100,000, but depending on your organization, that could be 15 grand or it could be $500,000. And I think that's just important to keep in mind too, as you're using this as a planning tool. So I think from my perspective, the thing that I find most helpful for us is this kind of, it takes you out 
of some of the details that can be so daunting at times and really gives you the opportunity to play and look and, and make meaningful decisions. And, you know, as variables do become more known, you can insert it into a place and have some, some idea of where you might land as uh, your end approaches. And so with that, I will kick it back to Jared. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jana. And, and thanks to Sean for, <clears throat> for going through those models. Um, you know, I, I probably, you know, I know you guys both mentioned this too, but, um, you know, we tried to keep things a little bit high level at this point. Um, you know, we don't want to dive in too much, but know the tailored features of, of both of these models to the specific organization, I think is what really provides the, the utmost value. And, and we try and keep, you know, the, the monthly compilation of numbers and, and data inputs to, to as minimal as possible, but at the same time, still monitor that flexibility and usefulness uh, of, of, of both of the models. And I, I think in both scenarios are, you know, illustrating those variabilities uh, as they come through. So, you know, I think as, as I look at Sean's model on that strategic financial impact model, you might be looking more three, four, five, six months down the road um, in terms of kind of projecting out those surges and dips and comebacks, but also a much more longer term uh, usefulness within that model as well, too, for looking at, you know, some longer strategic decisions. And then, you know, on that rolling forecast model, I, I think Jana hit it on the head when, you know, she mentioned about, you know, when you think about the timing of when you do your budget, uh, most oftentimes before the year even starts, you're a little bit behind in terms of where you're at, uh, you know, could be positive or negative. Um, so we continue to kind of hear those comments or questions from clients. How do I improve my budget process or how can we help improve their budget process? And, and I'd say for both of these models too, COVID or, or not, they have a lot of value in an organizational setting, um, even just on a, on a normal year because uh, because it does allow that flexibility, functionality, and variability to to kind of project out those results. And I know Jana touched on it just there at the end with the stimulus dollars and, and the lost revenue side of things. So we think there's obviously some value in that model as well, too, as you're looking at trying to get your hands on on some of those reporting requirements, uh, you know, with HHS in terms of how much lost revenue do you have? What are your additional expenses? I think as you kind of toggle back and forth between maybe the adjusted budget and, and your budget, you know, those are gonna be quick snapshots in terms of where did, we, where did we actually end up or where do we think we're gonna end up as you kind of look to plan out those funds. Um, certainly, you know, we've gotten a lot of those dollars in the month of April and the first part of May, but the reality is, is those funds really are gonna be uh, you know, could be utilized over the next, you know, 18 months to two years. Nobody really knows how things are going to play out, uh, you know, in terms of the, the overall impact to utilization, uh, you know, consumerism, unemployment, all of those things have a, a trickle down effect on how people utilize healthcare services. So I think for us to try and cram in between a two or three month period, what our lost revenue is at a I think that's a little unfair for a lot of our hospitals to kind of make that decision right now. Um, you know, so then as you kind of populate those actual results in and you can easily toggle back between actual and budget to really see kind of that financial impact, both in terms of increased expenses, the preparatory measures that, have, that are causing an issue, as well as that lost revenue side to help on that, on that external reporting. So, I just wanted to, you know, make sure we mentioned that as a, you know, certainly a compliance requirement coming down the, the pipeline from, from those funds that came in. Um, and just wanted to also, you know, reemphasize the, you know, the tailoring nature of each of these models to the individual organization. And, and what we even presented today was even condensed from what we've actually done from the client's perspective, um, knowing that we were a little bit limited on time and wanted to keep things in, in a good visible format. Um, but we really spend a lot of time in the, you know, the, you know, discovery calls with, with hospital, you know, CFO or CEO, just in terms of trying to understand 
from them what's valuable for from an output perspective what do they want to put in on a monthly basis uh, you know we have dollars in there we could easily do stats but i i think for most of our our facilities are dealing in terms of we're experiencing an x percent decline in gross revenue and and i think in there too we're seeing different declines for inpatient services versus outpatient and clinic so um, you know, so that's where we, I think we see a little bit of variation and, and, you know, we're willing to make it as tailored as possible on that front. So I think as Jana was sliding through the end of Sean's and before she started hers, there were snapshots of the individual models that we kind of went over, hopefully for you to just kind of jog your memory. Obviously the webinar itself will be uploaded to our, to our homepage, to the landing page where the registration was at if you want to uh, rewatch it again or if if there's something that jogs your memory you want to go through it we're trying to put together a you know a live tutorial video too so maybe more on that to come in the future but um, I guess before we sign off here we do have about five minutes uh, before the bottom of the hour so if any questions have have come through Amy uh, can you cycle them through or do I need to pull them up on I um, nothing has come through. Well, for a two to three webinar on a Friday afternoon, maybe everybody checked out. Uh, but for those that, that stayed through to the end, uh, we do appreciate your attendance today. I know, uh, as I mentioned at the out front, there's a lot of webinars that are getting uh, on the calendars these days, but this is obviously a, a, lot, of, a lot of things that impact our, our audience. So. Um, our contact information is up on the screen right now. So if, if something comes up after after our webinar today or as after the weekend, if you had some time to think about it and you have any questions, you know, we definitely encourage you to reach out to, to any one of us. So I appreciate, uh, appreciate everybody's attendance and thanks to Sean and Jana again for going through the model and uh, uh, stay safe everyone and enjoy your weekend.